Hi, everyone. In this video, I want to go over a few of the main points of Robert Adams's article, Must God Create the Best? Now, I suggest that you pull up the article, Robert Adams, Must God Create the Best, from the course site, and look over it as I am going through this. I'll give you some keys as to where I am, but since this is fairly short, and I'm just trying to give you an idea of how to approach this article and understand some of the main points, I'm going to let you look through your version of the article. Okay, fair enough? The author's thesis is right in the second paragraph of the paper. By the way, you can always pause the video and go and look in the paper for where I'm talking about. <clears throat> he tells us that in this paper, in the second paragraph, that he will argue that the Judeo-Christian theist must hold that the actual world is a good world, but need not maintain that it is the best of all possible worlds. This, of course, is a response to Leibniz's main points in the theodicy. In the theodicy, Leibniz claims that God, being a necessarily good and all-powerful being, must have created the best of all possible worlds. So the actual world, the one we live in, is the best of all possible worlds. Adams asks the question, why can it be that for every possible world, there is another one that's better, so that there is no maximum degree of perfection among possible worlds. If that is the case, he says, it is unreasonable to blame God if he created a world that's less excellent than he could have created. From here on then, he will assume that there is no best of possible worlds. The idea that God would have to create the best possible world assumes that God is an act utilitarian, according to Adams. A utilitarian is someone who holds that one should always maximize happiness. So if God is a perfect being and therefore a perfect act utilitarian, God would have to create the best possible world. Adams argues that utilitarian views are not typical of the Judeo-Christian ethical tradition, and so he will not set aside the idea, so he will set aside the idea that God must be a utilitarian. This leads Adams to argue against two objections to the idea that God could have created an inferior world, that is, a world that was less than perfect. First, a creator who created a less excellent world than he could have would necessarily wrong someone in doing so. Second, the creator's choice of an inferior world must manifest a defect of character. Adams will argue against both of these objections. In his counter-argument to the first objection, he makes a distinction there are two kinds of creatures, actual creatures and possible creatures. Adams asks, what creatures would God wrong if he were to wrong anyone? God cannot wrong merely possible creatures because there is no obligation to any possible being to bring it into existence. If God can wrong any creatures at all, they can only be creatures that exist. In his counterargument to the second objection in section 3, Adams argues that grace is the key moral ideal that God should have in his character. He defines the gracious person as someone who loves without worrying about whether the person he loves is worthy of his love. He says on page 324, A God who is gracious with respect to creating might well choose to create and love less excellent creatures than he could have chosen. End quote. Therefore, God's graciousness in creation does not imply that the creatures he chooses to create must be the most excellent. Rather, it opens the possibility that it would be perfectly consistent with God's ideal moral character to have created a less than possible world. In section four, Adams entertains a counterexample to his position that there's nothing wrong with God having created creatures that were less than perfect. He entertains a thought experiment whereby we are to imagine that parents intending to conceive a child and know that a certain drug invariably causes severe mental retardation decide to take the drug and conceive of a severely retarded child. He admits that we all would have a strong inclination to say that such a person or persons would have done something wrong. 
he thinks that the moral intuitions in this case seem to be inconsistent with two conditions that he previously proposed. One, that a creature has not been wronged by its creator if it is no more miserable than it would have been had he never existed. And two, no being who came into existence in better circumstances would have been the same individual as the creature in question. He calls these conditions four and five on the top of page 327. So in the drug case, both conditions have been satisfied because A, the child is not worse off than if it had never existed, and B, it would be a different child had it been conceived under different circumstances. It would have been a different person because its genetic makeup would be different. He says, quote, I do not see how its interests can have a, an, uh, pardon me, uh, quote, I do not see how its interests can have been injured or its rights violated. Maybe I, is, I do not see how its interests can have been injured. I believe that's what it says uh, or something equivalent, or its rights violated by the parents bringing it into existence as retarded. In the last section of the paper, Adams does admit that even though he does not think that the parents wrong the child, he does think that the parents did something wrong. He says that our disapproval of the action is based on the following principle, which I summarize as, pos as follows. It is wrong for human beings to knowingly cause the procreation of an offspring that is notably deficient in comparison to normal human beings. Adams apparently holds that God would operate by this principle, and so should we, though he doesn't explicitly explain this. I hope this video has helped you understand this very interesting reading. Thank you for your time and attention.